Hi, good, good morning, everybody. Yeah, that sounds better. Okay, thank you for having me this morning. Today I'll be sharing with you my journey and my story as I put it in a book called Two Brown Envelopes. In 1973, my father sent me to England to do my A-levels. During the 70s, there were too many distractions that as a student, as a young student, I got distracted and I lost focus. Among these distractions, there were the end of Vietnam War, the October War in our part of the world, the energy crisis in Europe, and not to mention the musical festivities with Pink Floyd and the dark side of the moon at the time. And dark it was as I failed my A-levels and I couldn't get to university. I had to call my father on a collect call from a public booth in London, asking him to give me one more chance to do my studies. My father refused and he asked me to come back home. In his office in Kuwait, I noticed two brown envelopes on his desk. One brown envelope was thicker than the other. And then he gave me the lecture of my life, what a failure I was, how I failed him, and how I failed myself. And that I don't deserve anymore all the savings that he made for my education in the university in England. And he shoved to me the thinner envelope, where in the thin envelope, I noticed that there were only $200 thought he was teasing me, but no, he was firm, and he insisted that this is what I deserve, and I have to manage my life going forward. With the help of my mother, I left to Damascus, and within one month, I managed to get a scholarship to a country called Bulgaria. I have never been to Bulgaria. I didn't know where was Bulgaria. I didn't know what language they spoke. I didn't know what kind of people they were. The only thing I knew about Bulgaria was the Kashkaval cheese, like all of us. So being in Bulgaria and Sofia in the student hostel, on my metal bed, I sat and I realized that I had burnt all my bridges and that I had no other choice but to go forward. And this is where I decided to have three things that I carry until today as my mantra. I decided to be dynamic, to get out as quickly as possible out of Bulgaria, to be diverse, to learn the language and to acquire the knowledge, and to be distinct. These were the three Ds that I still carry until today as my mantra. And distinct I was. I have graduated from Bulgaria with a master's in medical electronics that landed me a job in Siemens. And this job in Siemens that I have had, it gave me the chance to acquire the love and the passion for the software industry. As I have realized the importance of the software in driving medical apparatus, medical equipment, and other machinery. Two years later, I decided to move on in life, and I went to Orlando, Florida. Not to work with Disney, but Orlando was the epicenter at the time for technology due to its proximity to NASA and to Cape Canaveral. And being in Orlando at that time, I was lucky enough to witness the birth of the PC industry and to realize the democratization of the computer awareness in the US by having all these people attend to the showrooms, to big stores where there were computer marts, computer lands, radio shack lights, and everybody was interacting with the nascent technology with which was the PC industry at the time. This is where I decided to come back to Jordan and to start my own business. And this is where in 1984, I came to Jordan. And since then, I have been working as an entrepreneur. And I would like to share with you today my entrepreneurial journey. Although it's represented here in a straight line, 
but my entrepreneurial journey has never been straight. I had my high ups, I had my low downs, it was a roller coaster, but by the end of the day, I managed to survive because for me, you know, through difficulties to the stars, this is a logo that I have learned from the Royal Air Force in England. And I would like to represent my journey in the acronyms of STARS. As a startup in Jordan, I started my company, which was called Jordan Computer Center. That was back in 1984. That was the first street level shop in Jordan. And with that, I started, or we at the company, started selling computers, mainly home computers, for Edutermin. We managed to sell 10,000 computers reaching 50,000 people at the time. If this shows anything, this shows the love of education and the knowledge you know, that we have here in Jordan. But with the 1990 war that erupted in the Gulf area, myself, I became bankrupt. I lost my business. I was indebted in millions of dollars to the banks. And this is where we at the company, we decided to shift focus and to move from B to C to B to B. And by moving from B to, from B to C to B to B, it was thanks to the software industry that was just being acquired or being developed on the PCs. And this is where we saw that the first uh, mover advantage where we started developing the first phone banking in the Middle East. Developing the first phone banking in the Middle East gave us the opportunity to spread all over the Middle East and to connect people furthermore to the computers by acquiring further information. With that being said, we managed also to win the, uh, the RFP in Jordan for the national ID. It gave us an, a huge opportunity to understand how to deal with databases and mainframes and this gave us the opportunity later on to win the E-Gate in UAE and in Dubai Airport, as you all know it. But the most important trigger event in this, er in this uh, era, which is the turnaround, was the announcement of Swift putting their software on a PC. As historically, Swift used to have their softwares on mainframes and many frames. And for us, this was a huge opportunity and a golden opportunity because we could realize that we could uh, spread the SWIFT uh, network in all over the Middle East. This is where you know, we decided to move on and we became a SWIFT business partner in the Middle East. Becoming a SWIFT business partner in the Middle East, we uh, branched out to Dubai and we established a SWIFT service bureau to connect banks in the Middle East. By doing that, Within a span of a couple of years, we managed to put 14 countries on a SWIFT network, 450 banks on a SWIFT network. The importance of that here, we started creating financial inclusion, not only for people, but only for banks and for countries, because we gave countries the chance to import, to export, to trade, to have remittances, to have financial uh, 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 inclusion in their country and you know helping these countries for prosperity this you know our our uh, MENA region that we were covering was from pakistan south to libya west we covered all over the middle east and we interacted with all the banks that gave us a huge opportunity as you all know swift today has 11,000 banks that are connected to each other via the swift hub and having the middle east to be connected to the international or to the global network of financial uh, services was something great and a great achievement for us at Eastnets. As you all know, SWIFT transfers on daily basis $5 trillion of transfers. And these $5 trillion are almost equal to quadrillion dollar a year. In these quadrillion dollar a year, we are talking about $2 trillion of illicit money illicit money that is uh, uh, by the organized crime, which puts the organized crime as the third economy in the world after US, China, then becomes the organized crime. And this is something of, uh, uh, of gravity and something that uh, uh, anybody has to look at. But with the 11th of September coming, 
and the uh, disaster that took place. We have realized the importance of combating financial terrorism, and we have realized that we need all of us to live in a safe and secure world. And this is where we realized also the importance of the compliance software. We raised capital out of the Gulf, and we acquired the company in Belgium. By doing this, we were exactly moving like the salmon fish. We were moving against the stream and against the flow. And this triggered INSEAD University to write a case study about East Nets because we were the only Middle Eastern company that has acquired a European-based company in technology. But the importance you know, of all of this, that we managed to transfer knowledge out of Belgium to Jordan, where we have now all of our back office, we have all of our engineers that are serving 800 banks globally out of Jordan. With that being said, that was a time you know, for an accelerated growth because we could attract investors. And among the in investors that we have attracted were the World Bank, where the World Bank you know, came and gave us a subscription agreement for $10 million. Unfortunately, in 2008, the financial, crime, uh, the financial crisis hit us, and this is where the World Bank, which is with their arm IFC, they decided to pull their offer, leaving us high and dry. And this is where, you know, we at the company had to start looking, you know, how to defend our core and how to defend our new business that we are spreading with it globally. At this time, and, uh, uh, you know, we decided to get a loan, and this is where we opted to go for uh, investment bankers, and we got a bridge finance. This bridge finance had tough conditions. These tough conditions were more or less related to put options that we had to meet in a year's time. In a year's time, we could not meet the put options, and myself being the guarantor of the company, I was subjected to harsh conditions. Luckily, I was in Jordan. I realized I was sentenced to three years imprisonment in absentia, and I was put on the Interpol list, and I was wanted, you know, myself, I became a criminal, although I was fighting, you know, financial crime uh, globally. And this is where, you know, in the company, we started all the realignment. Out of Jordan, we realigned all our sources, all our functionalities, we retrained ourselves, and this is where we have focused furthermore on going forward and how we take the company to a better. But as life goes in parallel, as you all know it, you know, this is where I had to park my problem, but at the same time to manage the company because we have objectives of servicing our uh, uh, customers, and at the same time, we had to continue with the development with the uh, uh, speed moving uh, technologies that we are dealing with. Couple of years later, we managed to settle all our uh, uh, issues with the uh, uh, investment bank in Dubai, and I managed to go back. And as Dr. Ashraf mentioned, to my shock, we have realized that the cyber crime was growing in a way and the cyber activity in a criminal way was growing higher. And this is where we have realized that also our own service bureau in Dubai was hacked. But this time it was not hacked by criminals, it was hacked by the National Security Agency, which is you know, an arm for the CIA. Why is that? Because you know, they wanted to have uh, uh, access to information for all the financial transactions that were taking place in this part of the world. Of course, that was a reputational damage for us. This is where we had to also rebuild everything that we have had from security, from uh, reputation, from uh, uh, our engineering, and even all of the data centers, so at least we could keep afloat. But this storm is nothing to do, or is nothing you know, to be mentioned with the huge storm that was taking place in the horizon. And the storm that I'm talking about in the horizon, it's more or less related to the fourth industrial revolution. And as you all know, that now billions of people's homes are connected to internet, 
billions of people are connected on their mobiles and this is giving them the chance to have a better interaction and access of knowledge thanks to the processing power. At the same time, we are having, we have created trust with the e-commerce and the exchange of information, bearing in mind that this industrial revolution will be creating jobs that we haven't heard of, to the level that 65% of the kids today will have jobs we don't know anything about. And even within the span of next seven years, there are going to be 80 jobs or 80% of the jobs that we are not aware of. This is all thanks to the industrial revolution and what is taking place in the industry globally. The industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution that we are living in today, it is unlike any industrial revolution that we have had before. The first industrial revolution, the impact of the steam engines. The second industrial revolution, the impact of electricity in the industry. The third industrial revolution, the impact of the information technology. But now the fourth industrial revolution, it is unprecedented because the fourth industrial revolution has a velocity and speed that is un, uh, uh, unprecedented and it's also exponential. It is not even linear. The second part of this industrial revolution, it is more related to the depth and breadth of convergence of technologies. And this is where uh, it is very important to look at. It. And the third part of this fourth industrial revolution is more or less related to the transformation. As transformation, it has nothing to do with only technology. It is a transformation that is societal it will impact every part, bit and part of our society with this transformation. Having said that, also this in the fourth industrial revolution, it's impacting physical, as you all know, with the drones and the autonomous vehicles and the 3D printing and the robotics. It, is, it has a digital component where we are seeing a total disruption of how businesses are done. And we are seeing also a biological impact where we are seeing how the genetics and the genetical engineering is changing and impacting too many things in our life. All of this, we have to keep an eye on it because this is just the tip of the iceberg and how this fourth industrial revolution is taking us and impacting us uh, all together. Finally, in a nutshell or a book, this is my journey. I have written a book. I would like hopefully that to share with you but also, I want to tell you one thing, that I'm sure that each one of you, in a certain moment, he will have the two brown envelopes moment. This is standing on a crossroad between the past and the future. This is standing on a crossroad between failure and success. This is standing on a crossroad or a fork river between being optimistic and pessimistic. This is standing on a, on a crossroad of saying, no, I cannot do it, or I can do attitude. So I will advise you all, all the time, to pull the empty envelope and fill it up with your hard work and your perseverance. Thank you.